The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, welcome to, I guess this is going to be part two, because we really want to investigate uh, and understand rejection, because it can be kind of sneaky. And the solution is not just acceptance, it's supernatural acceptance. And supernatural acceptance means it comes from God. And it, 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 just, it just, God loves on you as a believer to receive that intrinsic value. And when you walk out of that intrinsic value, rejection doesn't have its power. And so, but uh, I want to cover uh, at least uh, 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 quite a few indications of rejection and its counterpart acceptance when the acceptance is actually operating in your life as a believer. So Father, we pray right now that you're going to uh, let us hear with our ears and see with our spiritual eyes those indications of anything that needs to be removed from our life so that we can be effective in ministering health to people. Uh, the days ahead are going to be flooded with people who are going to need the emotional healing that all of you people are really well equipped. And what comes easy to you does not come easy to a lot of people. So uh, understand this. You'll be tested on this in my church anyway. And uh, and, and if you haven't already been dealing with a, a number of people on this subject, you will. Um, so part two uh, in uh, understanding this rejection is the truth is you don't need to strive for acceptance. And you that is the solution in the world. They will strive for it and they will find something that gives them a certain amount of fulfillment. But we're already accepted. If, we've, if we accept it from Jesus, if we accept it, that the fact is we are accepted in the beloved, but that can't just be a mental concept. That acceptance has to be received, written on the tablet of the heart until you own it. When you own that acceptance, then you can combat rejection very easily. You can reject rejection. But let's, let's look at, again, what rejection looks like, because some people could say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, let's, let's look at how it raises its ugly head in uh, different arenas of our life. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to tell the story about the uh, little girl in the lunchroom uh, that we, we taught her, I think she's probably a middle teen, middle school. middle school, middle school going into teenage years. And there was this clique of girls and she just desperately wanted to be accepted. And the more she tried to be accepted, the more they played on that and would purposely hurt her feelings. They'd invite her to stuff and then disinvite her. That would hurt, right? Especially when you want to be part of. And uh, she says, uh, she called from the New England states and she called down here and she said, Pastor Dennis, you taught me how to forgive and I know how to forgive from the heart. But this is every day, every single day in school. This is, you know, like five days a week. I make this attempt and they, and they just make fun of me and pick on me and what have you. And I said, well, you know how to forgive. You forgive them, that cleanses you. Uh, from the hurt and the pain. But when it comes every single day, you say, you know what, I think I need a better strategy. So instead of just teaching you how to forgive, which you already know, and get your peace, how about going on the offensive? And to this day, I thought it was one of the most beautiful stories of dealing with the rejection, especially when it was so blatant. I mean, they planned to do this to her. And yet her weakness was, what did she want? She wanted acceptance. You don't strive for that kind of acceptance. All right? You, you have to get it from God. And we, we dealt with her on that as well. But here's what she did. She went, and sure enough, she went in the cafeteria, and the little clique gets together. 
and they all started but mean girls <laughs> all of a sudden all starting at the same time and she did what I told her to go on the offensive she dropped down to that secret place and out of that innermost being she allowed a fire hydrant and she'd like the idea of a fire hose you know because those get blasted you know and she blasted them with love while they were talking she really wasn't listening to the nana 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 stuff that they were saying she was focused on releasing the love of god and blasting them and while she was blasting them which is interesting you can't get guidance from the holy spirit when you're when you when you're battling with rejection you can't hear you can only hear that voice but when she started blasting them with the love of god all of a sudden she could hear the lord had her turn her head and she looked to another table in the cafeteria and there was a group of girls there and she felt led to go sit there. She went and sat there and found out every single one of them was a Christian and every single one of them was praying for her because they knew the abuse that those girls were doing. But rather than approaching her, she had God direct her to them and they became good friends. So I'm telling you, that's, that's reality in the spirit. That's not some kind of game plan, all right? Because in the world, to get acceptance, there's, there's all different. Um, but rejection operates out of the insecurity and jealousy. Insecure. Just insecure, want to be accepted. I would imagine a lot of kids struggle with this. But unless you're saved, unless you're born again, you don't really have the God solution. So, you know, it's... Uh, most of the people we pray for, most of their damage was done pre-salvation uh, in situations like school, neighborhood, home, right? How many people you, you've prayed for that you see that's, that's some of the root issues, the way they grew up and how they handled uh, these things. But uh, we have to understand that we have intrinsic value when you're saved. That intrinsic means internal value system that nobody can take away from you, but you still need to accept it. Should you choose this message and accept acceptance, <laughs> you could be set free. Uh, now, uh, rejection, if it operates on insecurity and jealousy, because to get acceptance, you want something that somebody else has. Which again, that violates your intrinsic value. You're trying to be somebody you're not, or you're trying to be a copy of somebody else. You want what they've got. Uh, you're, you're, you're minimizing your value. You haven't really truly discovered your value in God. And so insecurity and jealousy are a sign of rejection. So if you catch yourself, being feeling insecure, I'm not like everybody else, comparing yourself amongst yourselves, there's rejection in there. Nobody called you to compare. Compare yourself among yourselves is foolishness, according to Scripture. So let's call it what it is. It's foolishness, comparing yourself amongst yourselves. So if rejection operates on insecurity and jealousy, acceptance functions out of love and belonging. And when I received that, that revelation of God's acceptance for me, regardless of what people, all through my life, the most beautiful thing was, I belong. And because I belong, I've got a lot to give. That needs to be a reality written on the tablet of every believer's heart. I belong. And because I belong, I've got a lot to give. But that belonging was me and God. I belong to him. I'm a son. You'd be a son or a daughter. You belong that way. If you're trying to belong to some group, you're going to, be, you're going to get back into striving and trying to prove something that doesn't need proven. So <clears throat> those with rejection are constantly <clears throat> battling jealousy and insecurity. Since uh, security originated in a secure relationship with our parents, don't be surprised if... Uh, You don't feel safe or secure because in many times growing up in your home, you didn't feel safe and secure. We did that when we traveled church to church. We used to do a little quick little thing just to show people that they haven't dealt with everything. We would we called it finding father. And finding father is like, how safe did you feel growing up in your household? How um, important did you feel being raised in your household? And on a scale of 1 to 10, we have people write down on a scale of 1 to 10 how, 
how significant they felt in the house and how secure they felt. And if, you're, if your scale is below 10, somewhere there's probably a need for healing. And even if you had the most marvelous parents, you weren't necessarily the most marvelous child, right? So uh, you may have wanted, no matter how much they lavish. I've seen in a family where there was three kids, one thought mother was a demon, and the other one thought she was the most wonderful person. I only wished, and looking back, that I could have known her better. Same household. So guess what? A whole lot of, of delusion is your perception. So you know what? You're better off. Honor your mother and father. And, and you, you don't have to honor their bad behavior or their dysfunction. But you honor them by releasing forgiveness to them. When you release forgiveness to them and release demands and expectations that they be like you want them to be, then God can fill the place. I'm telling Jennifer that uh, uh, oh, years ago, probably 10, 11 years ago, we, we taught on reparenting. And I'm saying that that's what's going to take place in the church. We need mature sons and daughters who are like mothers and fathers who can reparent. And uh, the, the part that bothers me the most is that you must have the mothering before you can have fathering. But many people quit at mothering. Mothering is to make you feel safe and secure. And you got to have that. You have to have that. But the church sometimes will stay there and they will baby you, you know. And your expectations are for the church to take care of me, you know, that kind of thing. Yet fathering is required, but not until mothering has made you feel relatively safe and secure. When you feel safe and secure, then fathering say, now it's time to unpack the gold that's in you. Now's the time to see you become all that you could be. Now's the time to test. Uh, a school teacher, male or female, has nothing, it doesn't matter whether they're male or female, a school teacher does that to you. How many people love to be home and have mom provide and dad provide and they give you everything you want? And it's kind of like you're in the womb. In the womb, you don't, you don't do anything except take, receive. Then you go to school and the teacher has the nerve to give you tests to see what, what your aptitude is, what your interests are, what, what, what some of your gifting is, what could be developed. And all, everybody's different. So it's going to require you unpacking what's really in there. Well, we don't like the unpacking part because that requires me to do something. I like that other mothering part where I just feel safe and secure and the woman, I don't have to do anything. No wonder socialism is so popular with some people. No wonder they call it the nanny state where if everything's done for you, it'll kill the initiative. And you know what? God requires you to move in initiative. He created you a spirit being that has creativity in there, and you are supposed to fulfill the purposes of God for your generation. His purposes in you, not you trying to get approval. So, but really, uh, your identity or safety to a home so how does that apply? Say, well, my house was a mess and uh, everybody was dysfunctional. Well, then I would suggest that you be reparented, that you find a church where you can feel safe and secure and get reparented. Deal with your stuff. Unpack the gold that's in there. But don't be afraid of it. Don't just look for what are they doing for me. Look at what am I doing for them. How am I reciprocating? How am I taking what's in me and using it to benefit mankind? Others. Ah, what a novel thought. Now, those with rejection, they battle that insecurity and that jealousy because in many cases they grew up in a home uh, where safety wasn't part and parcel of their life. They didn't feel safe or secure. Many didn't even feel wanted. Those suffering from rejection or are insecure, they have a hard time of hearing a biological or spiritual father praise their siblings or co-laborers. That's As a pastor, that's one of the easiest things for me to pick out. If you have a hard time with someone else in the church getting praised, 
that's a clear sign you've got rejection issues. Um, biological, let's call it like sibling rivalry, competing against brothers and sisters in your own natural household, but also in the spiritual household, it will flow over. And uh, that means there's rejection issues there. The, those who are secure in their acceptance are so secure in the Father's love and favor that they're content to serve in any capacity that's necessary. It is real easy to take someone who is secure in their acceptance in God and do team ministry. It's difficult to do team ministry with someone who's competitive, sibling rivalry, comparing themselves with other people. But healed, accepted people, their redemptive mentality or their focus is to see other people become successful and become more all that they can be. That doesn't diminish you. Rejection people see that if I were to see someone else get successful, somehow that diminishes me. That is rejection, and that spirit's got to go. I believe there's going to be people getting deliverance. And these hitchhikers hang on to you, and as they get identified, it's like it's going to point the little finger on the inside. You can repent right at the time that I'm talking and receive forgiveness, repent, release uh, uh, any any person, place, or thing that you're so attached to that you've got to have it. Release the demands and expectations. Believers, uh, with that rejection, they're jealous of brothers and sisters in the body instead of being wanting to see them be, if you have healthy acceptance, see them become success. You want them to be successful. You want them to be all that they can be. And you rejoice in it. Uh, rejection issues seem to uh, try and earn the Father's love. That's worth writing down. If you feel like you've got to earn love, those with rejection issues serve God to earn the Father's love. It's not going to work. Those who are secure in their acceptance serve God out of a sense of belonging. Remember I said the primary revelation for me when, when, when God really dealt with that rejection and showed me that supernatural acceptance was I belong to him. And because I belong, I got a lot to give. Then you can do as unto the Lord because you're coming out of a healthy place. Your activity is not to get. You don't give to get. You live to give because it's out of the overflow. Now, uh, along rejection, uh, they have a tendency to constantly strive to earn the Father's love through accomplishments in either ministry or career. As a matter of fact, titles, position, is one way of having a trophy to feel better about yourself. Acceptance, achievement, then I can feel accepted. Those who feel accepted already know they're accepted. <laughs> and they serve others out of an abundance of this acceptance. It's overflow. You live to give. You don't give to get. All right. The next. Rejected individuals try to medicate the deep internal alienation. In other words, alienation from godly acceptance. So how do they deal with stuff? They alienate through works. But unfortunately, trying to gain acceptance through works is dead works. Those who are in a place of rejection are constantly trying to push down their sense of alienation and loneliness and lack of self-worth through constantly working, going from one relationship to the next, physical gratification and living a life of narcissism and self-indulgence. It's me, myself, and I, and I've got to do something to work this out and feel this certain way. Remember one of the 
uh, uh, Stina knows this from teaching on the, on the uh, work of the cross. Those who must have the approval of certain other people to feel good about themselves is rejection. Those who feel they must have the approval. Kids will try to get it from parents. Adults try to, husbands try to get it from wives. Church people try to get it from other church. Those who have this need to have the approval of certain other people to feel good about themselves have a lack of real acceptance coming from the Father. And no matter, the more they indulge, the more addicted they become. Uh, there's a larger hole in their heart. Uh, they go from one relationship to another, looking for gratification. However, the more they indulge, the more addicted they become. The larger the hole in the heart becomes, only the love of the Father can fill that deep emotional seed they have. Um, it feels good to be mothered doesn't it? When you think about it, and we need it, to be so loved and cared for, but at the same time, you say well, all that love and care for talk is wonderful, but what are you going to do with your life? Or are you just going to be part of a nanny state that does everything for you, and you just expect society owes me a living? Huh? J. Edgar Hoover, way back when, said that was the sign of a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> He says, someone who believed that the society owed him a living. And we've got generation raised with that attitude of entitlement. So those who suffer from rejection are often driven by the need for success. Many attempt to accomplish great things to satisfy that deep yearning in the heart for their father's approval. <laughs> but it was available if they only saw how available God is to the individual, they can receive it righteously instead of unrighteously trying to get something that God already gave you. He wants you to see the beauty of his love for you. Receive it and quit trying to get it somehow. The more they indulge, the more addicted they become. The larger the whole becomes only to the love of the Father can fill the deep emotional needs they have. Most of the people that I've seen uh, discipled that really couldn't cut it in the long run had father issues. Men and women, they had father issues. At some point, they could not handle the reparenting because they never sufficiently dealt with their natural parents. If you don't deal with those root issues with natural parents, you'll transfer it over into the kingdom of God and view God the same way. Dysfunctional. Well, our God is not dysfunctional. So he's pure and holy. And he would, he would bring joy in your fulfillment of working the purposes of God for his generation. You know, there's too many scriptures that, that seem too obscure to a person with rejection, like all things are working together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. When you're in a place of acceptance, you see the trials and tribulations of life, but you go, now, thank God God's in control here because it looks really crazy out there. Rather than, oh, woe is me, the sky is falling. Now, those who suffer from rejection use people as objects to fulfill their goals. Uh-oh. Those who suffer from a spirit of rejection use people as objects to fulfill their goals. Supernatural accepted people, sons and daughters, they serve people to be a blessing in the kingdom. And you'll see, uh, I think the healthiest people usually say, uh, here, here's something just to bless the kingdom. Here's something to, they talk like that. They think like that. They have a redemptive mindset. It's not about what's in it for me. To this day, titles. People buy books based on what's in it for me. They look at the title and they go, what's in it for me? Now, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's not 
what can I learn to be of value to someone? Remember that story about the um, about the guy who he felt uh, this young man with a with a nice car. When he compared himself with the guy who was accusing him of that, they found out they both were raised the same way. In horrific brothers and sisters got shot, killed in the streets. There was no difference in the way they were raised, except that he did something with his life. Then the other one said, I just think I should be a manager. Well, have you ever read any books on management? Have you taken any courses? Have you, have you worked in any facility to where you could move up to be a manager? No, it should just fall out of the sky. Trust me, Christians, that attitude, it's not going to just fall out of the sky for you. That there is something that you need to find out from God and walk in His plan for your life, not, not your good ideas. The result of them being driven to succeed instead of being led by the Spirit, that's the problem. Driven to succeed. And you know what happens? It's kind of sad, but I've seen people that... There's nothing wrong with being successful, but when they're successful and they go and get into retirement age, you will see how much of that was in their flesh because then they retire and they're not controlling something anymore. And it's not transferred to kingdom. I can't imagine not wanting to help people till the day you die. I just can't imagine that. There's other people can't wait to retire so they can drive in a mobile home and travel the country. And no matter what your occupation was, you could have mentored somebody. There's somebody you could have been of value to instead of just you, yourself, and your selfishness. Actually, that's, that's a rejection issue too, to really just travel the country and enjoy yourself. That's, that's, that's mothering. There's no fathering in there. If you were a lawyer, then you should have been mentoring some young lawyer. Not just enjoying my retirement. I deserve, I earned this. And now society owes me pleasure because I retired. That's pure selfishness. Now, the spirit of rejection will repel natural children. And I gave you the story of my dad and my grandfather. My dad was illegitimate, so my grandfather rejected him. Your natural children can feel that being repelled. And <clears throat> those, actually, the same thing with those who could be spiritual children. The same thing. There's, a, I always liked what the Glenn said in the, in the early years potential. That means you haven't done it yet. <laughs> right? Isn't it true? Potential is a beautiful word. Oh, they've got great potential. But they haven't done anything with it yet. That's not, that's not a trophy winner there. God looks at your potential and he's waiting for you to do the plans and the purposes that he made for you. When my favorite thing with open mic is, is statements like, uh, God told me to quit my job. Oh, really? You know, one out of a hundred, that's God. Where, where are you going after you quit your job? Oh, I don't know. Oh, so God had you leave one thing without giving you any redemptive solution to do the next thing. You know. And of course, you know, that's the big God said. I don't believe everybody that said God said. I don't know about you. You've got Christian friends, brothers and sisters. Do you believe every time they say God said? No, but a healthy person that doesn't have rejection issues, they will bounce that off of people. I remember uh, Bishop Hammond talking about one of his prophets. He was correcting him and said, uh, I believe you've got a blind spot there. His board of governors, 30, 30 seasoned men said, that's true. Well, God's telling me, you, you guys don't know what you're talking about, and I'm right. 
that, that's commonplace. That's commonplace, unfortunately. But a person with acceptance is not afraid to bounce something off of other people in advance of making the decision. As a pastor, I used to get embarrassed for people who would ask me my opinion after they decided. You don't respect me. You don't want my opinion. If you really wanted my opinion, if you really wanted to be neutral and find out if it was really God, you would have asked before you made the decision, not after. You think there's some rejection issues in the church? I think so. And I think that God's going to cleanse it and you're going to be so gloriously transformed if you would just recognize that you are accepted in the beloved and you belong. And we're going to, we're going to teach you how to do that. We're going to teach you because it's not complicated. This is not complicated. What's complicated is understanding all the nuances of how sneaky this little devil is. This rejection devil was there in the beginning. When they got kicked out of the garden, they were rejected. Sin separates, okay? So we're going to keep looking at this until we say there's no more wiggle room here. If I have any of this, i got to get rid of it. You know, one of my... Uh, one of the easiest ways to see it is that your perception, you can't hear from God clearly. You can't see what God is saying clearly because you're hearing this other voice. And it shows up with statements like, you always, you never. Whenever someone says, you always, you never, right there they're in deception because that's not true of anybody. Always? Never? <laughs> Come on. So you know right there you're exaggerating and God doesn't do that. That's a rejection issue. You always, you never. You're demanding something from people rather than being living out of the acceptance to love brothers and sisters. You want to have them respond the way you want them to respond. It's like the parent, when you say, well, you can't make those kids. I most certainly can make those kids. Well, okay, moms and dads, you think you're making them kids do it? You know, they can sit down, but they might be still standing up on the inside, and eventually that's going to have to be dealt with. So, yeah, you didn't really make them sit down. Physically, they, you sat them down. Jennifer did that in preschool uh, ministry and, and as, a, as a counselor one time. She saw a boy, kid, kicking their mother, and the mother's going, Honey, don't do that. Honey, don't do that. Jennifer picked the child up and sat him in a chair and said, you don't do that. And the kid listened. Can you imagine that? Of course, that Jennifer's kind of scary, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I've heard stories that, 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 in, the, in the dentist's office, he has a, a little kid, and the mother warns him that he's, he doesn't comply. And so when he came to the visit, the dentist went out into the reception and went to the mother and said, you, sit. And the mother went and sat. That kid listened from that time on. <laughs> if this guy's got power over my mother, I'm not going to mess around in this place. So um, <laughs> we manipulate them with words, threats, and anything necessary that we have to control them. That's rejection. And there's healed and accepted people don't use people. They want to serve and release them and bless them. The spirit of rejection repels natural children and those who could become spiritual children. But if they don't deal with mom and dad issues, you can't disciple them in the spirit if their view of God is still distorted. You can only get them so far, and God wants mature sons and daughters. If everything that happens to you, say you're a clerk in a store, and a customer just reams you inside out and backwards, you can feel like it's all you and they didn't understand, and how dare they? They would have done that no matter who was behind the counter. You taking it personal is still a rejection issue. 
You're supposed to take the attitude, oh, dear Lord, that person needs prayer here. They're having a meltdown right here in my store. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But you don't get all wiped out, bummed out, and depressed and have a meltdown over somebody else's demonic behavior. <laughs> Leaders and parents. Uh, what we call this in the early days was uh, an orphan spirit where there's been uh, a lack of real fathering, not just mothering, but fathering. Where there's been a lack, it's like an orphan spirit. They, they're in turmoil. Um, ultimately, they will be runners to find a place where it's exactly what they want which that's kind of rough, isn't it? You could be running the rest of your life, finding it exactly suited for you rather than you change. You're looking for your environment to change and be conducive to you. So, but you, we covered this in the last message, but it's, it's good to remember that uh, rejection issues can cause anger. People that have uh, anger, tantrums, fits of rage even, um, they can't, they don't know how to rest in the father's ability to control and guide their future. Most of their anger is someone is not doing what they want, how they want, and rejection, remember we said, has pain in it. It registers in the brain. When someone's not doing what they want, pain, anger, blame. We did the little story about walking barefoot in the field. And you, your toe just gets sliced open on a sharp rock. Pain. This is the way the flesh works now. Pain, anger. Who was the farmer that left that rock there? Or how did I find the only rock? Or why did God let that rock cut my toe? Pain, anger, and then blame. And true believers, if you, if you are walking in the maturity that God called you to do, true believers walk a forgiveness lifestyle. The pain, the blame game should have been removed even as a baby Christian. So if you're still one who vents and blames uh, other people, uh, you're only revealing your own, your own wounding, your own pain that really only Jesus can resolve, not changing other people. That's not going to resolve your pain. Matter of fact, when we were kids in South Chicago, um, if somebody had a gun, you know what they called them? Problem solvers. <laughs> I'm going, oh, okay, I don't think that's walking in the love of the Father if a gun is a problem solver, right? But that's what they used to call it. It was a slang term for them, problem solvers. You know, if somebody doesn't do it your way, eliminate them. Rather harsh. Now, the uncontrollable anger, though, is something that you can see. And, and those that are accepted have the ability to walk in the supernatural rest of God. Now, we know that there, those that are rejected are always in competition with others. Even if they don't say it, they're thinking it. They're in competition. Who's getting accolades? Why are they paying attention? Nobody told me that. How about that one? Nobody told me. I never knew. That's a sign of rejection, too. They always feel like they're not informed like everyone else is informed. Inquire. A healthy person inquires. A healthy person asks questions. A healthy person seeks out. Everyone is not obligated to inform you. Now, rejection also, and this one's an important one, and most of you have dealt with this, in, whether in a small group or by phone ministry, and we have more and more capable people of doing that, thanks to what uh, Pastors Cliff and Steen are doing, training you people, troubleshooting. There's hurting people out there, and they need ministry. And one of the things that's really important 
is that teaching them to forgive themselves. Rejection people feel bad about themselves. If you've got rejection issues, you feel bad about yourself. But what, if you're healthy, you walk in the love and the acceptance of the Father. There's no more room for feeling bad about yourselves. When you make a mistake, you repent. But you don't have to feel bad about yourself because that's a perverted form of pride anyway. And you don't have a right to reject yourself when God says, I love you and accept you. You want to argue with God? Maybe it makes you think that that's justifiable, but it's not. You're supposed to love what God loves and hate what God hates. If you start hating yourself and God loves you, you're at odds with Him. So rejection really requires that people feel accepted with a sense of that divine love that enables them to walk confidently in the joy of the Lord, regardless of the fact that all humans are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, that's a fact, all right? The next one is those who suffer from rejection receive their primary identity. Remember, we're talking identity now. If you suffer from rejection, this is the way you're viewing yourself. You're viewing yourself primarily through material possessions Positions of authority, titles, your physical appearance, or activities. I'm going to go over that again because if you suffer from rejection, your primary identity comes through stuff that you have, possessions, positions, of authority, titles, your physical appearance, and activities. One time I saw uh, a, a pastor that was to mentor me when I was a baby Christian, and I was looking up to him to learn from him. But um, it took a softball game for me to see how over the top he was competitively. It didn't show in other areas. But I mean, you know, when you see the pastor playing softball, throwing the bat, yelling at everybody, <laughs> it's not real impressive. <laughs> and I'm saying, it's just, I want to say it's just a game. But it's like, as a young Christian, I'm looking at that and going, I wonder what his father was like. <laughs> wonder what kind of issues he has not dealt with. He's a good man. I'm just saying that kind of manifestation of competitiveness and rage was so unhealthy, it was over the top. And, and the blame game. And I'm thinking, he'd have been better off not playing softball. But then he'd have probably been a mean coach, too. So what are you going to do? Um, anyway, but uh, their primary identity is through those various issues where, and this is important, when you're secure in acceptance, you're grounded as a child of God, son and daughter, receiving the Father's affirmation. Now, in the, sometime back when God gave me those seven revelations of life-changing result, one of them was affirmation. And when I said, God, what do you mean by affirmation? It's not a pat on the back. Supernatural affirmation means you own it. It's written on the tablet of your heart. It's not just a nice job, Dennis. It's like, I own that affirmation. God says, that's scripture. That's me. It's real, and it's written on the tablet of your heart, and nobody can. It'll be harder for you not to believe it than to believe it. It'd be that easy. That's when you own it. That's affirmation. 
And affirmation then means if it's truly been written on the tablet of your heart, the fruit would be that you would demonstrate it as a lifestyle. And I'll tell you what, acceptance is clearly that. But it was I belong, and because I belong, I've got a lot to give. No. All right, we're going to get to the conclusion here. But we're still going to show the different... We still have to talk about how just how ugly this rejection is. Don't fall asleep on me, because that might be a sign of rejection. Okay. All right. Because in conclusion, we've got to... The greatest gift that was ever given to man was acceptance by God. When you think about it, wow, what a precious gift. And we need to learn to accept it, receive it, serve with it and walk in the love of the Father with it. So at first it starts out as an imprint of his acceptance. Then that imprint moves into some kind of representation. And lastly, that image is written on the tablet of your heart. You're actually back in image the way God intended you to see yourself as a mature son and daughter. An imprint would be like when a baby's born and women are better at this than men. They go, oh, that looks like Uncle Roy. Yeah, the kid's got no teeth, no hair, <laughs> and it looks like Uncle Roy. They see stuff that I don't see. But later on, it moves from that imprint to a manifestation. All of a sudden, they grow and they start having characteristics. I can still remember my cousin uh, had a walk, had a, even a, a walk that was like his father's. So you saw a representation of the Father. It went from just being an imprint to where I can't, I really don't see it yet, to a representation to where someday you do like I did, you grow up, you look in the mirror and you go, oh my goodness, there's, I'm my father. All right? Did any of you ever do that? I'm my mother, I'm my father. When you, when you looked in the mirror, yeah, well that happened. <laughs> then, so you, you move in these stages. Now, Now we've got to understand something. I'm going to give you a bunch of little things here. Rejection motive is to feed a need. You can just put down rejection equals feed a need. Rejection is feeding a need. When you think about it, when you get your feelings hurt by somebody, what was the, what, what is it really that you needed that you didn't want to get from God, that you wanted from them, that you should have gotten from God? feeds there's a need identify the need the second one it manifests as push pull isolate you learn this as a little kid but when adults do it it's not as pretty push pull it's like a rubber band effect rejection is weird it pulls the person towards you and then you push them away and it and for a person with rejection it feels good <coughs> to push and pull Push and pull. I want and I want to prove that I can get it, but then I'm going to put you away. And then I'm going to isolate myself. I'm not going to talk to silent treatment. I'll walk by you in a huff, and you won't know. <laughs> like nobody will know. I am rejecting you. Rejection is a control problem. These are the important ones to write down. I'm going to go over them again because I think you should have all of these written down. Rejection motive is to feed a need, number one. It manifests as push, pull, isolate. You could just write down push, pull, isolate. Push, pull. It's a tactic. It's a rejection tactic. And it's obvious. And people should be embarrassed when they're doing it. Rejection is a control, the third element. It's a control problem. God is not in charge of their life. They are in charge. That's why manipulation is so common with rejection. Rejection won't submit, fourth element. It's stubborn and it's idolatry. Ouch. It won't submit. I've saw people with rejection issues that will purposely go for counseling but never submit to any of the <laughs> advice nor really pray it through. Just kind of fake it. 
so that they can say, well, I've been to the best, oh, I've been to this company, and I've been to them, and I've been to... They will seek counsel everywhere out of a point of pride, but they'll never submit to it. All right? That's the fourth element. Stubborn idolatry won't submit. The fifth element, they will rebel, attack, or manipulate. Depending on their the situation, they rejected people. Remember, it's push-pull. So they will either attack or reject you, snub, or manipulate. Hmm. Look for a, a way to control the sixth element. I just said rebel, attack, manipulate. The sixth element is they see self as the victim of people and circumstances. That's really obvious. Rather than seeing that I am accepted in the beloved and that I can walk in the rest that is in God, regardless of the goofiness of the world around me, all things are working together for the good, have a redemptive mentality. Like Joseph, pit, prison, he always had a redemptive mentality. He was optimistic. That comes from someone that has accepted the love of God. Rejection sees self as a victim of people and circumstances. Then we've said this one a number of times. Rejection's lie is I must have the approval of certain people to feel good about myself. If you can't feel good about yourself between you and God and you and God alone, if, if you were the only person on the face of the earth and it was you and God, would you love him? Would you serve him? Would you live for him or serve him? And that's the seventh one. And the last one is rejection always includes anger. Now, after we beat you up on this topic of rejection, and I'm assuming everybody has some of it to relinquish. <laughs> if that's the case, now we're going to get to the solution. It is not hard. But if you have any of those previous eight issues, like I won't submit, nothing's going to happen. Your self-idolatry won't let it happen. Well, that must be for other people, but not me. I don't need that. And the need is that I have myself on a pedestal. And if I admit that I have rejection issues, then I'm going to have to come down off my pedestal. Oh. Now, here's the solution. And I want you to learn this because it's not just for you to deal with any telltale sign. But the day's coming when you're going to be able to minister effectively to other people that are hurting with this. This is the painful one. And we're going to know not just how to receive it, we're going to learn how to give it to others. Otherwise, what, what is your Christian walk if it's just about you? Matter of fact, I have potential leaders in this church and my previous church that I knew would never become a leader because they could only receive, they could never give to anybody else. That means you're, you're stunted. All right, so here it is. Here's solution. Point number one. Forgive the perceived perpetrators. Remember that girl in the cafeteria? Forgive the perceived perpetrators. Two. Learn a new way of keeping a score. You know what that means? You don't keep score. <laughs> Love doesn't keep score of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13. Because a person with rejection will have at their disposal all past violations. And they can rattle them off. That means you've never cleansed your heart if you can rattle them off. Three. With the acceptance, you do as unto the Lord, not as unto man. Do as unto the Lord, not to man. Number four, I've, I've seen success with this, with telling somebody even on the phone, reject rejection. <laughs> huh? I mean, that doesn't sound too complicated, but it's a factual. Reject rejection. Who says you have to take it in? I'm accepted in the beloved. So-and-so is rejecting me. I go, oh, that's too bad. I'd have accepted you. 
but I, I can't change you. <laughs> so, you know. When a test comes and you're being tested by someone's rejection towards you, real or imagined, and keep that in mind, a whole lot of rejection isn't really there. See that person on the cell phone in the grocery store? I know they're talking about me. <laughs> That's your issue. <laughs> All right. All right. So when a test comes, you can resist. Once you've had a measure of the approval of the Father, you can say, That's not me. I'm not going to own that. Release forgiveness to the perpetrator, but I'm not taking that in. There's so many people that when they, they keep saying, how do I deal with it? I got hurt. But you know what? There's a walk in the spirit where you, don't, where you can feel the hurt, but you don't have to own it. That's a mark of maturity. Once you, and that takes practice by reason of use, where you, res, you feel it, but you don't own it. Own it means you sucked it in. But if it ain't coming from God, why take it in? I can feel hurt when people are hurting, and it's, it's beneficial. It's redemptive. In other words, if somebody's hurting emotionally, and I feel it, I bear witness to it. I don't suck it in so I can hurt too. That needs trained in, in the body of Christ. And you're not a burden bearer. You're a helper. The burden bearer does not mean you... you, you Take their pain on you. No, Jesus took our pain and our sorrow. You, don't, you can bear witness to it to discern, to distinguish, to differentiate so that you can minister effectively. Okay? So, the number one truth. When God dealt this with me, and here's the pattern, and you can do this with anybody. I released forgiveness to my father. And when I release forgiveness, I released him. Now, this is important because rejection don't want to do this. I release forgiveness to him and I release all demands and expectations for him to change. Oh, if you saw how many people suffer demanding someone else change. You change. Because when you forgive... God changes your heart and you see they're the victim. Rejection people see themselves as the victim. That is not biblical. You learn to release forgiveness to them because Jesus died for them too. You release forgiveness to them and you release them of demands and expectations to change. Your heart changes and you see them as the victim. Not you. That's key. And that's the first thing God did for me. He said, Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention. My thoughts are continually toward you. They're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. These are the scriptures you need to get into. You need to get into the fact that God's thoughts are continually toward you. Your, your intrinsic value is, is, is marvelous in his acceptance. And he wants to build his character in you and establish you in a new life that walks in the rest of God and in the acceptance that's written on the tablet of your heart. And nobody can erase it, not even you when it's done properly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.